Irony after Fichte. From Soren Kierkegaard's The Concept of Irony, with continual reference to Socrates. It was in Kant to call to mind only what is generally known, that modern speculative thought, feeling itself mature and coming of age, became tired of the guardianship in which it had lived hitherto under dogmatism, and, like the prodigal son, went to its father and demanded that he divide and share the inheritance with it. The outcome of this division of the inheritance is well known, and also that speculation did not have to go abroad in order to squander its resources because there was no wealth to be found. The more the I in criticism became absorbed in contemplation of the I, the leaner and leaner the I became until it ended with becoming a ghost, immortal, like Aurora's husband. The same thing happened to the I as to the raven who, fooled by the fox's praise of its person, lost the cheese. Because reflection was continually reflecting about reflection, thinking went astray, and every step it advanced led further and further, of course, from any content. Here it became apparent, as it does in all ages, that if one is going to speculate, one had better be facing in the right direction. Speculative thought utterly failed to see that what it was seeking was in its own seeking, and when it would not look for it there, it was not to be found in all eternity. Philosophy walked around like a man who is wearing his glasses, and nevertheless is looking for his glasses. That is, he's looking for something right in front of his nose, but he does not look right in front of his nose, and therefore never finds it. But that which is external to experience, which like a hard body collided with the experiencer, whereupon they parted with the force of the collision, the thing in itself, which never ceased to test the experiencing subject, just as a certain school in the medieval ages believed that the visible signs in Holy Communion were present in order to test faith. This externality, this thing in itself, constituted the weakness in Kant's system. Indeed, it became a question whether the I itself is not a thing in itself. The question was raised and answered by Fichte. He removed the difficulty with this in itself by placing it within thought. He infinitized the I in I am I. The producing I is the same as the produced I. I am I is the abstract identity. By so doing, he infinitely liberated thought. But this infinity of thought in Fichte is, like all Fichte's infinity, his ethical infinity is ceaseless striving for the sake of this striving itself. His aesthetic infinity is ceaseless producing for the sake of this producing itself. God's infinity is ceaseless development for the sake of the development itself. Negative infinity. An infinity in which there is no finitude. An infinity without any content. When Fichte infinitized the I in this way, he advanced an idealism, beside which any actuality turned pale, an acosmism in which his idealism became actuality even though it was doceticism. In Fichte, thought was infinitized, subjectivity became the infinite, absolute negativity, the infinite tension and urge. Because of this, Fichte has significance for science and scholarship. His Wissenschaftslehre, theory of knowledge, infinitized knowledge, but he infinitized it negatively, and thus instead of truth, he obtained certainty, not positive, but negative infinity in the eye's infinite identity with itself. Instead of positive striving, that is, happiness, he obtained a negative striving, that is, an ought. But precisely because Fichte had the negative, his position had an infinite enthusiasm, an infinite elasticity. Kant lacks the negative infinity, Fichte the positive. For this reason Fichte has an absolute gain from the method. With him, science and scholarship became a whole out of one part. But since Fichte in his I am I insisted on abstract identity in this way, and in his ideal kingdom would have nothing to do with actuality, he achieved the absolute beginning, and proceeding from that, as has so frequently been discussed. He wanted to construct the world. The I became the constituting entity. But since the I was merely formally understood, and consequently negatively, Fichte went no further than the infinite, elastic, efforts toward a beginning. 
He has the infinite urge of the negative, its formative impulse, but possesses it as a fieriness that cannot get started, possesses it as a divine and absolute impatience, as an infinite power that still accomplishes nothing because there is nothing to which it can be applied. It is a potentiation, an exaltation as strong as a god, who can lift the whole world, and yet has nothing to lift. The starting point for the problem of philosophy is hereby brought to consciousness. It is the presuppositionless, with which it must begin. But the prodigious energy of this beginning goes no further. In other words, in order for thought, subjectivity, to acquire fullness and truth, it must let itself be born. It must immerse itself in the deeps of substantial life, let itself hide there as the congregation is hidden in Christ, half fearfully and half sympathetically, half shrinking back and half yielding. It must let the waves of the substantial sea close over it. Just as in the moment of inspiration, the subject almost disappears from himself, abandons himself to that which inspires him, and yet feels a slight shudder, for it is a matter of life and death. But this takes courage, and yet it is necessary, since everyone who wants to save his soul must lose it. But this is not the courage of despair, as Towler so beautifully says in an even more concrete situation. Yet this loss, this vanishing, is indeed the genuine and proper finding. As is known, Fichte later abandoned this position, which had many admirers and few adherents, and in some of his works tried in a more upbuilding manner to quiet and lessen the earlier full assurance. On the other hand, it appears from the works published posthumously by his son that Fichte also tried to become lord and master of that negative infinity by concentrating upon the very essence of consciousness. Since that does not pertain to this study, I shall deal with one of the positions related to the earlier Fichte, namely with the Schlegelian and Tikian irony. In Fichte, subjectivity became free, infinite, negative. But in order for subjectivity to get out of this movement of emptiness in which it moved in infinite abstraction, it had to be negated. In order for thought to be able to become actual, it had to become concrete. This brings up the question of metaphysical actuality, this Fichtean principle that subjectivity, the I, has constitutive validity, is the sole omnipotence, was grasped by Schlegel and Tieck, and on that basis they operated in the world. In this there was a twofold difficulty. In the first place, the empirical and finite I was confused with the eternal I. In the second place, metaphysical actuality was confused with historical actuality. Thus a rudimentary metaphysical position was summarily applied to actuality. Fichte wanted to construct the world, but he had in mind a systematic construction. Schlegel and Tieck wanted to obtain a world. But this ironic endeavor by no means ended with Tieck and Schlegel. On the contrary, in young Germany, it has a crowded nursery. In fact, in the general development of this position, considerable attention is directed to this young Germany. Here we perceive that this irony was not in the service of the world spirit. It was not an element of the given actuality that must be negated and superseded by a new element, but it was all of historical actuality that it negated. In order to make room for a self-created actuality, it was not subjectivity that should forge ahead, here, since subjectivity was already given in world situations, but it was an exaggerated subjectivity, a subjectivity raised to the second power. We also perceive here that this irony was totally unjustified, and that Hegel's hostile behavior toward it is entirely in order. Throughout this whole discussion I use the terms irony and ironist. I could just as well say romanticism and romanticist. Both terms say essentially the same thing. The one is more reminiscent of the name with which the faction christened itself, the other the name with which Hegel christened it. Irony now functioned as that for which nothing was established as that which was finished with everything, and also as that which had the absolute power to do everything. If it allowed something to remain established, it knew that it had the power to destroy it, knew it at the very moment it let it continue. If it posited something, it knew it had the authority to annul it, knew it at the very same moment it posited it, 
It knew that in general it possessed the absolute power to bind and to unbind. It was lord over the idea, just as much as over the phenomenon, and it destroyed the one with the other. It destroyed the phenomenon by showing that it did not correspond to the idea. It destroyed the idea by showing that it did not correspond to the phenomenon. Both were correct, since the idea and the phenomenon are only in and with each other. And during all of this, irony saved its carefree life, since the subject, man, was able to do all this. For who is as great as Allah, and who can endure before him? But actuality, historical actuality, stands in a twofold relation to the subject, partly as a gift that refuses to be rejected, partly as a task that wants to be fulfilled. Irony's misrelation to actuality is already sufficiently intimated by the essentially critical stance of irony. Both its philosopher Schlegel and its poet Tieck are critical. Thus the seventh day, which in our age is supposed finally to have arrived in so many ways, is used not to rest from the historical work, but to criticize. But criticism as a rule precludes sympathy, and there is a criticism to which nothing is established any more than anyone is innocent to a suspicious policeman. But the old classics were not criticized. Consciousness was not criticized as it was by Kant, but actuality itself was criticized. Now, there certainly may have been much in actuality that needed criticism, and evil in the Fichtean sense of the word, apathy and indolence, may very well have gained the upper hand, and its force of inertia may very well have needed chastisement. In other words, there may well have been much in existence that had to be cut away precisely because it was not actuality, but it was utterly indefensible for irony to aim its criticism at all actuality for that reason. That Schlegel was critical, I need only remind the reader, but that Tieck also was critical, anyone will certainly agree. If he also agrees that Tieck has embodied his polemic against the world in his dramas, and it takes a polemically mature individual to understand them, a circumstance that has made his plays less popular than they, considering their genius, deserve to be. But when I said earlier that actuality offers itself partly as a gift, the individual's relation to a past is thereby implied. This past will now claim validity for the individual and will not be overlooked or ignored. For irony, however, there really never was a past. This was due to its refusal to be involved in metaphysical inquiries. It confused the eternal I with the temporal I, but the eternal I has no past, and as a result the temporal I does not have one either. But to the extent that irony is good-natured enough to assume a past, this past must be of such a nature that irony can have a free hand with it and play its game with it. Thus, it was with the mythical past of history, legend, and fairy tale that mainly found favor in its eyes. The actual history, however, in which the authentic individual has his positive freedom, because therein he possesses his premises, had to be set aside. To that end, irony acted just as Hercules did when he was fighting Antaeus, who could not be conquered as long as he kept his feet on the ground. As we all know, Hercules lifted Antaeus up from the ground, and thereby defeated him. Irony dealt with historical actuality in the same way. In a twinkling, all history was turned into myth, poetry, legend, fairy tale, thus irony was free once again. Now, it again made its choice and played helter-skelter as it pleased. It took special delight in Greece and the Middle Ages. It did not, however, lose itself in historical views, which it knew to be dichten and wahrheit, poetry and truth. Sometimes it lived in Greece under the beautiful Greek sky, lost in the present tense enjoyment of harmonious Greek life, lived therein so that it had its actuality there. But when it became tired of that, it shoved this arbitrarily posited actuality so far away from itself that it vanished altogether. For irony, Greek culture had no validity as a world historical element, but had validity and absolute validity for it, because it was pleased to have it so. Sometimes it hid away in the primeval forest of the Middle Ages, listened to the secret-laden whispering of the trees, and built nests in their leafy tops or hid in its dark hollows. In short, it sought its actuality in the Middle Ages, in the company of knights and troubadours, 
fell in love with a noble maiden on a spirited horse with a falcon trained for the hunt on her outstretched right arm. But if this love affair lost its validity, then the Middle Ages receded far back into the infinite and faded more and more in ever dimmer outlines on the backdrop of consciousness. For irony, the Middle Ages did not have its validity as a world historical element, but had validity and absolute validity for it, because it was pleased to have it so. The same is repeated in all theoretical spheres. One religion or another was momentarily the absolute for it, but it also was very well aware that the reason it was the absolute was that irony itself wanted it so. Period. In the next moment, it wanted something else. Therefore it taught, just as it is taught, in Nathan der Weiss, Nathan the Wise, that all religions are equally good, Christianity perhaps the worst, and then for a change it was itself pleased to be Christian. It was the same with regard to knowledge. It judged and denounced every scholarly position, was always passing judgment, was always on the judgment seat, but never investigated. It continually stood above the object. And this, of course, was quite natural, because only now was actuality supposed to begin. In other words, irony refused to be involved in the metaphysical question of the idea's relation to actuality, but the metaphysical actuality lies beyond time and consequently could not possibly be the actuality irony wanted to have, could not possibly be given in time. It is against this judging and denouncing conduct on the part of Friedrich Schlegel that Hegel declaims in particular. In this connection, Hegel's great service to the understanding of the historical past cannot be sufficiently acknowledged. He does not reject the past, but comprehends it. He does not repudiate other scholarly positions, but vanquishes them. Thus Hegel put a stop to all this continual chatter that now world history was going to begin, as if it were going to begin at precisely four o'clock or at least by five o'clock. And if one or another Hegelian has attained such enormous world historical momentum, that he cannot stop, but at a dreadful speed steers to the back of beyond. Then Hegel is not to blame for that, and when it comes to contemplation, if even more can be done than Hegel has done, no one who has any concept of the meaning of actuality would be so ungrateful as to go beyond Hegel so fast that he forgets what he owes to him. That is, if he has been familiar with him at all. With regard to what authorizes irony to behave as described, it must be said that it is because irony knows that the phenomenon is not the essence. The idea is concrete, and therefore must become concrete. But the idea's becoming concrete is precisely the historical actuality. In this historical actuality, every single link has its validity as an element. But irony does not acknowledge this relative validity. For irony, historical actuality sometimes has absolute validity, sometimes none at all, because it has, after all, taken upon itself the significant assignment of bringing about actuality. But for the individual, actuality is also a task that wants to be fulfilled. Here one would expect that irony would properly have to show its advantageous side. Since it has gone beyond all given actuality, one would think that it must have to have something good to put in its place. But this is by no means the case. For just as irony managed to defeat the historical actuality by placing it in suspension, so irony itself has become suspended. Its actuality is only possibility. In order for the acting individual to be able to accomplish his task by fulfilling actuality, he must feel himself integrated in a larger context, must feel the earnestness of responsibility, must feel and respect every reasonable consequence. Irony is free from this. It knows it has the power to start all over again if it so pleases. Anything that happened before is not binding, and just as irony in infinite freedom enjoys its critical gratification in the theoretical realm, so it enjoys in the realm of practice a similar divine freedom that knows no bounds, no chains, but plays with abandon and unrestraint, gambles like a leviathan in the sea. Irony is indeed free, free from the sorrows of actuality, but also free from its joys, free from its blessing. For inasmuch as it has nothing higher than itself, it can receive no blessing, 
since it is always the lesser that is blessed by the greater. This is the freedom that irony craves. Therefore it watches over itself and fears nothing more than that some impression or other might overwhelm it. Because not until one is free in that way does one live poetically. And, as is well known, irony's great requirement was to live poetically. But by living poetically, irony understood something other and something more than what any sensible person who has any respect for a human being's worth, any sense for the originality in a human being, understands by this phrase. It did not take this to mean the artistic earnestness that comes to the aid of the divine in man, that mutely and quietly listens to the voice of what is distinctive in individuality, detects its movements in order to let it really be available in the individual, and to let the whole individuality develop harmoniously into a pliable form rounded off in itself. It did not understand it to be what the pious Christian thinks of when he becomes aware that life is an upbringing, an education, which, please note, is not supposed to make him into someone completely different, for the Christian's God does not have the infinite negative omnipotence of the Mohammedans, for whom a man as large as a mountain, a fly as large as an elephant, is just as possible as a mountain as little as a man, and an elephant as little as a fly, since everything can just as well be something entirely different from what it is, but is specifically supposed to develop the seeds God himself has placed in man, since the Christian knows himself as that which has reality for God. Here, in fact, the Christian comes to the aid of God, becomes, so to speak, his co-worker, in completing the good work God himself has begun. By the phrase living poetically, irony not only registered a protest against all the contemptibleness that is nothing but a miserable product of its environment, against all the commonplace people who, sorry to say, populate the world in such numbers, but it wanted something more. In other words, it is indeed one thing to compose oneself poetically, it is something else to be composed poetically. The Christian lets himself be poetically composed. And in this respect, a simple Christian lives far more poetically than many a brilliant intellectual, but also the person who in the Greek sense poetically composes himself recognizes that he has been given a task. Therefore it is very urgent for him to become conscious of what is original in him, and this originality is the boundary within which he poetically composes, within which he is poetically free. Thus the individuality has an objective, that is, its absolute objective, and its activity is aimed precisely at the fulfillment of this objective, and the enjoyment of itself in and with this fulfillment. That is, its activity is to become, for itself, what is an in itself. But just as commonplace people do not have any in itself, but can become anything, so also the ironist has none. But this is not simply because he is merely a product of his environment. On the contrary, he stands above his whole environment. But in order really to live poetically, really and thoroughly to be able to create himself poetically, the ironist must have no in itself. In this way, irony itself lapses into that which it is fighting the hardest. Because an ironist comes to have a certain resemblance to an altogether commonplace person, except that the ironist has the negative freedom with which he stands, poetically creating, above himself. Therefore the ironist frequently becomes nothing, because what is not true for God is true for man. Out of nothing comes nothing. But the ironist continually preserves his poetic freedom, and when he notices that he is becoming nothing, he includes that in his poeticizing. And, as is well known, it is part and parcel of the poetic poses and positions in life that irony promoted. Indeed, to become nothing at all is the most superior of them all. In the poetry of the Romantic school, therefore, a good-for-nothing is always the most poetic character, and what the Christians so often speak about, especially in troubled times, becoming a fool in the world. This the ironist actualized in his own way except that he feels nothing akin to martyrdom, because to him this is the supreme poetic enjoyment. But the infinite poetic freedom, always suggested by the inclusion of becoming nothing at all, manifests itself in a more positive manner also, 
in as much as the ironic individual has looked over a multitude of destinies, usually in the form of possibility, has familiarized himself with them poetically before he ends with nothing. In irony, just as in the world according to Pythagorean teaching, the soul is always on pilgrimage, except that it does not take such a long time. But even though irony is behind with respect to time, it perhaps has the advantage in the multitude of destinies, and certainly many an ironist, before finding rest in nothing, has run through much stranger destinies than the rooster presented in Lucien, which had first been Pythagoras himself, then Aspasia, the dubious beauty from Miletus, then Crates, the cynic, then a king, a beggar, a satrap, a horse, a jackdaw, a frog, and a thousand other things too numerous to mention, and finally a rooster, and that more than once, because it found the most pleasure in being a rooster. For the ironist, everything is possible. Our god is in heaven and does whatever he pleases. The ironist is on earth and does whatever he desires. But we cannot blame the ironist for finding it so difficult to become something, because when one has such a prodigious multitude of possibilities, it is not easy to choose. For a change, the ironist finds it proper to let fate and chance decide. Therefore he counts on his fingers as children do, nobleman, beggar, etc. But since for him all such difficulties have only the validity of possibility, he can run through the whole scale almost as fast as children do. What takes the ironist's time, however, is the solicitude he employs in dressing himself, in the costume proper to the poetic character he has poetically composed for himself. Here the ironist is very well informed, and consequently has a considerable selection of masquerade costumes from which to choose. At times he walks around with the proud air of a Roman patrician wrapped in a bordered toga, or he sits in the cella curulis with imposing Roman earnestness. At time he conceals himself in the humble costume of a penitent pilgrim, then again he sits with his legs crossed like a Turkish pasha in his harem. At times he flutters about as light and free as a bird in the role of an amorous zither player. That is what the ironist means when he says that one should live poetically. This is what he achieves by poetically composing himself. But we turn back to the earlier comment that it is one thing to let oneself be poetically composed, and another thing to compose oneself poetically. An individual who lets himself be poetically composed does have a definite given context into which he has to fit, and thus does not become a word without meaning, because it is wrenched out of its associations. But for the ironist, this context, which he would call a demanding appendix, has no validity, and since it is not his concern to form himself in such a way that he fits into his environment, then the environment must be formed to fit him. In other words, he poetically composes not only himself, but he poetically composes his environment also. The ironist stands proudly enclosed within himself, and just as Adam had the animals pass by, he lets people pass before him and finds no fellowship for himself. In so doing, he continually collides with the actuality to which he belongs, therefore it becomes important for him to suspend what is constitutive in actuality, that which orders and supports it, that is, morality and ethics. Here we have come to the point that has been the particular object of Hegel's attack. Everything established in the given actuality has nothing but poetic validity for the ironist, for he, after all, is living poetically. But when the given actuality loses its validity for the ironist in this way, it is not because it is an antiquated actuality that must be replaced by a truer actuality, but because the ironist is the eternal eye for which no actuality is adequate. Here we also perceive the implications of the ironist's placing himself outside and above morality and ethics, something that even Soldier declaims against, in pointing out that this is not what he means by irony. It cannot really be said that the ironist places himself outside and above morality and ethics, but he lives far too abstractly, far too metaphysically and aesthetically to reach the concretion of the moral and the ethical. For him, life is a drama, and what absorbs him is the ingenious complication of this drama. He himself is a spectator, even when he himself is the one acting. Thus he infinitizes his eye, volatizes it, 
metaphysically and aesthetically, and while his I sometimes contracts as egotistically and narrowly as possible, at other times it flaps about so loosely and disintegratedly that the whole world can be encompassed in it. He is inspired by self-sacrificing virtue the way a spectator is inspired by it in a theatre. He is a severe critic who knows very well when this virtue becomes insipid and inauthentic. He himself repents, but he repents aesthetically, not ethically. In the moment of repentance, he is outside and above his repentance, testing to see whether it is poetically appropriate, whether it could do as a line in the mouth of a poetic character. As the ironist poetically composes himself and his environment with the greatest possible poetic license, as he lives in this totally hypothetical and subjunctive way, his life loses all continuity. He succumbs completely to mood. His life is nothing but moods. Now it is certainly true that to have mood can be something very genuine and that no mortal life is so absolute that it does not know the contrasts involved therein. In a sound and healthy life, however, the mood is just an intensification of the life that ordinarily stirs and moves within a person. An earnest Christian, for example, is well aware that there are moments when he is more profoundly and vitally gripped by the Christian life than he usually is, but he does not therefore become a pagan when the mood passes. Indeed, the more soundly and earnestly he lives, the more he will become master of his moods, that is, the more he will humble himself under them and thereby save his soul. But since there is no continuity in the ironist, the most contrasting moods succeed one another. At times he is a god, at times a grain of sand. His modes are just as occasional as the incarnations of Brahma, and the ironist who considers himself free thereby falls under the horrible law of world irony and dredges along in the most frightful slavery. But the ironist is a poet, and that is why, although he is sport for the whims of world irony, it does not always appear so. He poeticizes everything poeticizes his moods, too. In order genuinely to be free, he must have control of his moods. Therefore one mood must instantly be succeeded by another. If it so happens that his moods succeed one another so nonsensically that even he notices that things are not quite right, he poeticizes. He poeticizes that it is he himself who evokes the mood. He poeticizes until he becomes so intellectually paralyzed that he stops poeticizing. Thus the mood itself has no reality for the ironist, and he seldom vents his mood except in the form of contrast. He hides his sorrow in the superior incognito of jesting. His happiness is muffled up in bemoaning. At times he is on the way to the monastery, and along the way he visits Venusburg. At times he is on the way to Venusburg, and along the way he prays at a monastery. Irony's scientific scholarly endeavor also ends up in mood. It is especially for this that Hegel criticizes Tieck, and it is also present in his correspondence with Soldier. At times he has a clear grasp of everything, at times he is seeking, at times he is a dogmatician, at times a doubter, at times Jacob Bohm, at times the Greeks, etc. Nothing but moods. But since there always must be a bond that ties these contrasts together, a unity in which the enormous dissonances of these moods resolve themselves. Upon closer inspection one will reveal this unity in the ironist. Boredom is the only continuity the ironist has. Boredom. This eternity devoid of content. This salvation devoid of joy. This superficial profundity. This hungry glut. But boredom is precisely the negative unity admitted into a personal consciousness wherein the opposites vanish. That both Germany and France at this time have far too many such ironists, and no longer need to be initiated into the secrets of boredom by some English lord, a travelling member of a spleen club, and that a few of the young breed in young Germany and young France would long ago have been dead of boredom if their respective governments had not been paternal enough to give them something to think about by having them arrested. Surely no one will deny. If anyone desires an excellent picture of an ironist who, by the very duality of his existence, lacked existence, I will call attention to Asa Loki, 
We perceive here how irony continues to be totally negative in that in the realm of theory it establishes a misrelation between idea and actuality, between actuality and idea, and in the realm of practice between possibility and actuality, between actuality and possibility. In order to demonstrate this further in the historical manifestation of irony, I shall examine its most important representatives in some detail.